My name is Amit Sen, and I'm really thrilled to be working with Experience Futures as a member of the board of directors. My current role is at the headquarters of the UN Refugee Agency, UNHCR, in Geneva, Switzerland. Um, and that comes uh, after about 15 years with the UN working on human rights issues and humanitarian protection for people in crisis, people affected by armed conflict, persecution, human rights violations, uh, and large, huge level insecurity. And my current role uh, at our headquarters is actually on humanitarian system reform. So as I'm trying to make the entire thing work better, it's taking a massive step back and saying, what are we doing? that we might not even have anticipated that may be causing more problems uh, than they alleviate and may be doing more harm than good. And once you start digging in that do no harm line of inquiry, um, you find that there's so much to be done. You know, when we talked a couple of months ago, um, one of the things that you described really in vivid detail was some of the ways that um, refugees and stateless individuals um, used mobile and digital tools to access you know, everything from financial support to legal aid. Could you describe that a little bit? Because I, I was yeah. very moved by that. No, I, I find it, I, I am too, because what I find is that people in crisis, I mean, we used to talk just about refugees as the UN Refugee Agency, but of course there's, there's a much broader spectrum of people in humanitarian crises. There are people that are internally displaced within their own countries. There are people who are legally stateless. They don't have the protection or the citizenship of any country in the world. That means there's no state that says, you know, it's my legal responsibility to protect and safeguard this person as a national, as a citizen. Well, what we found, long story short, is that a lot of people displaced by that crisis were using IT on their own to do family tracing and reunification. Like and digital like it. digital tools that they, that they had access to. Exactly. I mean, they were yeah. using social media, they yeah. were using communication apps, yeah. but they, they were doing it in a way where they could kind of do checking on people's, you know, uh, latest location, uh, try to verify with you know, multiple family members or other sources where a family member was, uh, verify that person's identity. And essentially they were more effective on their own. On their own, using, yeah. Right, using essentially the, the, the smartphones and, and the, um, the tech that they had access to that, through that platform to both track, trace, and reunify uh, wow. family members. So it's, it's just really interesting because I think we were sitting there saying, how do we do this? Yeah. And here you have a community that's in crisis. That's super interesting. And I think that the, uh, you had also talked a little bit about this moment where tools that were given to people that were needing financial assistance or legal assistance, uh, where they didn't know how to navigate or use those tools that had been provided by NGOs or government organizations or even the UN itself. I mean, I think that one of the huge shifts, and I, th I think it's a it's a moment of recognition probably for the private and public spheres, is that within very short notice we may need to move towards remote operation, and remote in, in, uh -huh. increasingly in, you know increasingly means digital, right? Yeah. So if we have lockdown measures, if we have movement restrictions, if we have quarantines, all of which we've had, if we have uh, travel restrictions between and within countries, right? then the way that we reach one another, whether it's to provide or, or to, to you know, uh, sell a, a good or a service or to provide a critical humanitarian intervention, it just needs to change and it needs to change yeah. very quickly. So what's yeah. the experience, uh, what's, the, what's the UI of that tool yeah. and how yeah. navigable is it and how not only fit for purpose, but fit to person. And I think that's one of the complexities that, that I want to get to where I think the, the, the set of questions you're asking and the set of solutions you're exploring are so rich. So one of the things that I think we all realize, and we realize this through, if you don't mind my jumping a bit back to consumer experiences, yeah. is that we're not identical by a long yeah. shot in terms of yeah. our race, our identity, our nationality, our sexuality, our class experience, our, our education, any of it, right? Our, our um, physical abilities or disabilities. When you have 80 million human beings from myriad countries, uh, and the thing that's the same about them is that they're all in crisis and they need life-saving assistance. Yeah. One thing that I think we struggle with is how do we get to an equitable experience of delivery rather than an equal? I think there's a move already to tailor private sector uh, consumer experiences to individual needs. And one of the ways we can do that is by better harnessing 
I think, uh, data and honestly and machine learning. But the ethics around that set of questions are complex as well. And if you don't mind my saying, I think that there, we're, we're in a place now where we have two kind of competing interests and we need to find a way to really reconcile them meaningfully and not see them in opposition. And one is the need to be data-driven and evidence-based. Yeah. So the most dangerous thing to do is to say, well, we know what 80 million people need and we're going to give them one package and one square shape yeah. of what that humanitarian assistance looks like. Right? And the only way to, to not do that is to have a better read on who they are, yeah, where they're coming yeah. from, what they want critically and what they don't. What we really need is a dialogue. What we really need is to listen and yeah. to collaborate. And that goes to, I think, goes to user experience because that dialogue, if we're talking about doing it with or through tech, it's not going to happen unless the user experience is accessible. A lot of the, the UI is, is completely opaque yeah. uh, and, and downright you know, um, dysfunctional. So yeah. I really wonder what kind, uh, you know, what's missing in terms of maybe we do need a little bit more of, it could be healthy to be informed a little bit by this kind of consumer ethics of like, we're developing a product, right? Yeah. And this person is our client and yeah. we want their experience to be a functional and if not enjoyable, at least a functional one. Um, and I don't know, perhaps if the private sector is a bit ahead, I think that they, yeah. they may be. Well, I can, I can speak to that part of it. And I can <laughs> tell you, unfortunately, that for the most part, it's not. And um, I, I mean, I think that when I go and talk to, I mean, having come out of, of, of two very large organizations with, with roles that are literally to do what you're talking about, it's the same dialogue, you know, trying to convince people that, human-centric design and designing for the individual is important and that it should be resourced and it should be, you know, funded. It's interesting because I think that, you know, having spent my entire career in the, in the private sector, the, um, the, the, the flip side of that story that I would tell is that every individual commercial experience seeks to capture that person and lock them into that experience. Hmm. That's right? interesting. And creates barriers by and large hmm. to prevent people from moving between services or systems. That's interesting. Uh, your data is inoperable. Your, um, right. you know, moving from one system to another um, is very difficult. I mean, there, you do see things now like the ability to log on across multiple sites using your Google ID, mm -hmm. um, which I think that sort of thing is actually very important, especially for mm -hmm. people who don't understand how digital ecosystems work to be able to right. log in seamlessly across multiple sites is good. But by and large, every organization seeks to create what we describe as a walled garden, right? This, right. this, this thing where you capture an individual, right. And, and there it make you make it very difficult for them to take the data or the experience or the tools and use it somewhere else so that the burden is on the user mm -hmm. to think about how to stitch all these things together and um you know across different websites across different mobile apps so i think that there's um you know there's definitely not um it's, there's definitely not some secret sauce in the private sector Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that can be leveraged for government or for humanitarian efforts. Each of these interfaces, uh, just the user experience, is really difficult, really unnavigable, really unintuitive. And then when you, when you look at the ecosystem between them and, or across them, it's even harder. And I think um, what, that, what that tells me, what's, what's interesting about this, is that there's a certain level where we can talk about this in a relatively dry and analytical way, and you can probably help me break down what's wrong in that process. But there's another level of exhaustion, which is the emotional weight of having a special needs child and being yeah. worried that you're not going to get the services in place or that you might get disenrolled if you don't uh, reserve that, that child spot or you don't make the payment immediately, yeah. you don't get reimbursed in time. And I think that that, that emotional weight, that emotional um, energy, it, it, it's not something to minimize because I think we, we think of these things as perhaps technical problems, and they are, design problems, and they are. But when somebody's dealing with something that has that kind of um, uh, consequence behind it, it's even harder. Yeah, I think that's very interesting. I mean, and I think it's, um, and there's so many stories like this. And, and well, I'm curious to hear, you know, examples from your work. I mean, like, like mm -hmm. you know, we had talked at one point and you mentioned a few minutes ago, examples from displaced individuals or stateless individuals, you know, people seeking legal status. But are there any stories that you can share from your work about people like to help humanize it with with people who are trying to understand this question 
Yeah, I mean, I think there are a couple. Um, one of the things that we really need to do is, you know, when people move across an international border uh, or even within their own country and they're fleeing something like a war, you're dealing with people who have incredibly acute problems. You know, people yeah. may have lost family members, they may have lost limbs, they may need uh, immediate and life saving medical interventions. Uh, one of the categories that I was working with is really very moving and tragic were um, expectant women, pregnant women, and young mothers who had, were recently widowed by the war. I mean, these are yeah. people that are moving with, as you can imagine, I mean, some of them, their children had congenital birth defects that needed life-saving assistance at birth. Um, there are two things that, that come to mind. One is that when you're talking about the numbers we're talking about, again, with Syria, it's 11 million. So it's 6 million internally and about 5 to 6 million displaced externally as refugees. You need robust, reliable data um, on these people, on their needs, yeah. to, to manage what's going on with them. What had happened is that, to be totally honest, we were in competition with each other. Hmm. We all wanted to have the definitive data platform to collect and manage this sensitive, important protection data. Yeah, And because we didn't really coordinate, what, what, ended up, what ended up happening was a proliferation of different systems that didn't have interoperability yeah. into which this information is being recorded. So at the end of the day, it's incredibly difficult to say with any confidence or any clarity, what is the total number of people who have this need? And how is that number shifting and changing over time? Is it yeah. more? Is it less? Uh, you know, is it different by age bracket? Is it different by, by gender? Is it different by disability? So... It's interesting because I even come to this thinking, well, you know, looking to the private sector, I've been told my whole life that competition drives excellence, it creates choice, it always delivers the best experience to the individual, right? The yeah. more that entities compete, the, the, the better the end product is. But here's an example where those kind of market principles of competition didn't produce efficiencies. Instead, we have fragmentation. We have, inter we have a lack of interoperability. So that's just maybe one and, example. And, and I think one of the things you had talked about uh, in a conversation early on were examples where, um, uh, and, and I think it was, you know, in abstract for us as a specific individual that you were aware of, but you were talking about how, and you mentioned it earlier too, examples where say in, um, in a refugee situation, if a if financial uh, tools were given to someone via a mobile phone to a woman and they didn't understand how to use that device often that they would give it to a man and that would create an, a massive, massive, obvious issue. I really want to say this. I think the only way to think through that um, is to be in genuine conversation. And that, that's two way. It's on silly, but it is two way. For a long yeah. time, we said that communication with people in crisis is us telling you, this is yeah. where to get your rations. These are your rights as, you know, under international law, or these are, this is what human rights are. And you should know your rights. That, is itself incredibly limited and, and prescribed and, and arrogant. What we really need to be doing is being in dialogue with people. And I think that's the paradigm shift that I'm hoping can happen with the user experience, Yeah, is to, is to engage in, in a dialogic process that for us, whatever we're doing, whether providing a private service, a humanitarian service, or both, we, we have a paradigm shift where we embrace that dialogue as a necessity and something that benefits us as practitioners. And that we, we start to work in different ways where when we develop, uh, whether it's an individual um, user experience or an ecosystem, um, that we, we build those considerations into that design process. That, that, I, think that's, I think that's super powerful. I think um, if you could begin one effort you know, in your work, uh, what would it be? Would it be focused on create, like creating digital tools that literally created a dialogue? Would it be focused on a specific humanitarian crisis? Would it be focused on a specific population? Um, like if you could wave a magic wand and have a partner from the private sector, what would you partner with them on? That, that's a really, really good question. Um, I, I think I think one of the things that we've talked about, it's a little bit more on our side, is harnessing potential machine learning to, to make better sense of these numbers that are just kind of crippling in their enormity, right? Like 80 million forcibly displaced, 10 million stateless. I think to do um, a humanizing job of meeting people's needs, that has to be more individuated. It can't be sure. you're one of 80 million or you're one of 10 million because it's not going to be the right the right intervention. So I think that there's enormous promise within within uh, machine learning and AI to, to sort through uh, the data that we have to, to deliver 
uh, more accuracy in how we work. From the UI side, I, I think it's really interesting. I think one thing that would be super interesting would be to take a step back and talk to people in crisis about how they use tech how they use data, what, what parts about it they find empowering and promising yeah. and what parts about it they find possibly dangerous and problematic. Um, one thing that I think is, is really interesting with any tool is that it, it can introduce risks, as I was just saying, that, that, that can be easy to overlook, right? So giving a woman a, data, um, a mobile yeah. phone sounds like a really empowering gesture, but it could create a set of risks we don't see. Um, one of the things that I saw you know, I saw different things with people having access to tech. So the issue of refugees and, and internally displaced people sorting out family tracing and reunification on their own using things like geolocation and GPS and, and yeah. messaging apps and social media, which they did yeah. with, you know, tremendous resourcefulness. I saw a flip side as well. I saw, you know, smartphones being used to expose children to pornography and, and harmful content. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So um, I think, and really vulnerable children, children that maybe don't have parents or children that are living on the street, you know, that aren't going to have somebody to intervene and say, stop this, this is, this is really dangerous, this is really inappropriate. So I think what would be really interesting would be um, to start with some listening and start with an analysis that's done as a partnership with people um, in different, different social locations, different kind of specificities and say, well, what is this bringing to the table for you what what risks is it potentially introducing? What problems does it possibly yeah. solve? And what would you like to change? And I think we could start by asking really simple questions. Yeah. Um, if you don't mind, uh, one of your questions was kind of on personal experiences. Yeah, absolutely. In my work, and I kind of wanted to jump to that. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yes, please. No, 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 because it kind of goes to this a little bit. If that's all right. Yeah. So back when I was in the U.S. and I was doing, uh, I was representing asylum seekers in federal court. You know, getting a grant of refugee status is supposed to be like winning the lottery because you get a package of benefits, you get legal status to reside in the country, you can get a green card, you can become a United States citizen, and you can do family reunification. You can petition for your uh, nuclear family members to join you safely in the U.S. rather than you know the ones that essentially didn't get out still being um, at life and death you know risk in the country of origin. So it's supposed to be winning the lottery. One of my clients, we got her refugee status, but when she got her official documentation. Her name was misspelled and her last name and first name were inverted. So they put her last name first and her first name last. So this meant that it was impossible for her to enroll to get her benefits. Wow. And the amount of work we had to do together, it, as you say, it was a full-time job. Um, and it was incredibly difficult. And that was at a time where just a few things were being moved online with yeah. enrollment, right? And I just checked just now before we talked, because you were kind enough to send me the question in advance. Yeah. That site that provides the opportunity to enroll in those benefits is down. Is, is down as well. Is down yeah. now. No, it's it's inoperable. I mean, there's a there's a oh, URL. Wow. It's inoperable. Right. Exactly. In okay, in the US. So wow. I mean, I think one of those questions, I mean, I think there are a couple of questions. I mean, do you have access? What is your access like? And what is your experience with platform A, platform B, and platform C? And I think it'd be really interesting to look at a spectrum between platforms that are supposed to be more consumer oriented, where the person, the end user we're envisioning is, is a client or a customer of sorts who we envision as having choice to go elsewhere, even though there is maybe an imperative to wall them in to a degree, or a person in crisis who is trying to enroll for um, you know, housing subsidy in the United States as a recently recognized refugee. Or to get their, you know, to get a service in in a country that's affected by a crisis, you know, like where I was just working. Yeah. But I think that listening could be really exciting. That's fascinating. That that's, you know, it's interesting. I think that there's, um, there's tools that in there are tools in the in the private sector that allow for corporations who are designing to engage with customers on things like wide scale testing of interfaces or you know, allowing people to participate in online research that allows for organizations to make better choices. But I think what we're talking about here is industrializing that at a scale that, that most companies just don't ever do. Um, and I think that that dialogue is, is technically feasible, but I'm not aware of anybody that's really pursuing that, right? Because I think to a certain degree with every organization, there is still this mentality of, we're going to listen to you, but really, we're just going to get enough input to tell and then tell you and give you the thing that you've told us in forgetting the fact that they've only asked 
a very, very, very small minority of the people who might use their services or tools. And I think when you bring that to humanitarian issues or issues that affect people's legal status or their rights, that becomes a, a much larger, much more important question. I mean, it's really interesting in a way, because the more we talk, the more I honestly see a convergence of these two worlds and a convergence yeah. of these two paradigms. And I think it's curious how they've been bifurcated a lot. When you think about people in the US, we don't tend to think of them as having humanitarian problems or having yeah. their human rights being tenuous or vulnerable. But if you're talking about getting a COVID test or getting a vaccine or yes. getting into a hospital, yeah. we're talking about life and death. And yeah. healthcare is a human right under international law. You're talking about kids being able to enroll in distance learning. Education is a human right. It's part of child development. Yeah. So human rights are on the table, I think, even in yeah. uh, the first world, even in the United States, even within the boundaries of our, our, you know, our own home countries. And I think, you know, even for me, I'm immensely privileged, but I've got a child with a disability. Well, ensuring non-discrimination against kids with disabilities, that they're in, they're in the, the inclusivity and that they're, they're able to go to school, they're able to learn, they're not yeah. uh, ex expelled and evicted. I don't want to say it's exactly the same of what somebody who's just fled a bombing is going through, but I think that it's a bit of an artificial separation sometimes, right? Yeah, because I yeah. think that really, really germane and, and exigent rights issues are at play for people who are, are struggling with some of these interfaces and experiences and ecosystems in the first world. And I think conversely, there's been too much of this idea that when we work with people that are in really um, apparent crisis, that this is somehow charitable, that they're not clients. They're not customers. Yeah. They don't have the set of economic imperatives or rights that a traditional client or customer has. I think we need to start looking at them more as people who, you know, may be um, in a situation of desperation, but they are people who do make decisions, who do have choices, and we should create yeah. an experience for them that that meets, you know, that meets their needs and and who they are. Yeah, that's great. Well, Ahmed, thank you so much for taking the time to answer the questions today. I really appreciate it. That's been a pleasure. I love. Uh, talking with you every time we talk i feel like i learned so much and uh it's such a motivating issue i think it's it's an area you know it's interesting maybe just one last point if you don't mind yeah, please. so the work that i do now is under a new kind of a new framing for the humanitarian sector and it's called accountability mm -hmm. to affected people it's kind of interesting we we as the refugee agency used to always say refugee 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 we've moved away from that because there's so many different kinds of people that are affected by humanitarian crises and not all of them are refugees so now we now we have this that terminology and it's an interesting idea accountability to affected people what it means at the end of the day is that the primary person that has to measure our effectiveness and our performance is that person in crisis. It's not a government, not a donor, yep. it's not a state, it's not a you know massive private foundation that's bankrolled a, a, a significant amount of our work. Our boss as such is that person and that's the person to whom we're accountable. Uh, but if that's the case, I mean, I think that that's a nice framing, but if that's the case, we really need to reimagine the process with that person and what they see as a user, as especially as we move more towards digitization. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's really right. I think that's really right. All right, well, thank you very much.